So this is module three, and this week we are talking about how to make decisions. How in Python, really any programming language, our, our, how do we get it to do something? We've, we've gone through how do we get data into a program and out of a program, and we've done some calculations. But that's very limiting, just what we've done so far. What we really need to do is we really need to go and determine how to build processes, to build algorithms. And all an algorithm is, it's a procedure for solving a computational problem. Um, and we, you know, we can think any of the labs are computational problems. We can think our final project is a computational problem. And that computational problem over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to help you guys break down into smaller computational problems that can be more easily tackled. So the foundations of algorithms are decisions and branching, which is what we're doing this week. Looping, which is next week, and that is basically making decisions repeatedly based on changing data. Functions, which is encapsulating your code. Right now, we're going to talk about local scope this week. We're going to talk about um, blocks of code that are run based on a decision. Well, in Module 5, we get to take everything that we've done from the last four modules and name it. Then we have data structures in Module 6. And through Module 6 is what you need for your project. Module 7, we talk about data storage, which is basically writing stuff to disk and reading it from disk. And Module 8 is the final object-oriented module. And that just is another way of encapsulating or putting lots of different data things together. So we got some new keywords this week. We have if. Elif and else. And there is an order for these three keywords. If is always the first question. Elif is a subsequent, a subsequent question. And you can have as many subsequent questions as you need. And else is the very last. Now, the only one of these to make a decision that you absolutely have to have is if. But we'll, uh, we'll see in a few minutes why we would use elif and why we would use else. But so these are the only keywords that are going to have an order. And you need to remember the order. If basically says, OK, Python, it's time to make a decision. Elif says, I want to make another decision, but it's related to the if. Else is, when all else fails, do whatever I tell you to do. So that's kind of the way we can think of this. We're also going to have something new called relational operators. For the last two weeks, I've been saying we know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. Well, this the reason I say single equal sign is because this week we're introducing the double equal sign. The double equal sign is a relational operator. It's used when you're using if or elif. And it means is equivalent to. So you're going to have a variable or a value on the left-hand side of the double equal sign and a variable or a value on the right-hand side of the double equal sign. So you're asking, is what is on the left-hand side the same as what's on the right-hand side? And the same with not equal to. When you put an exclamation point, in, an exclamation mark in front of an equal sign, it means not. So you're doing the opposite. So instead of it being the same as, you're saying they're different. Less than, less than or equal, greater than, greater than or equal. And by the way, you can use the exclamation point with any of the relational operators. There's no space between the exclamation point and the other operator, and it will do the same thing. It makes it opposite. Now we have one more thing, and it's called Boolean operators. Because, 
Well, let me, let me say something that most people think is a little crazy when I say it, but computers are stupid. Computers, you can have one of two outcomes with any question, true or false. And what that means is that we're very limited in the kind of questions we can ask a computer. If I'm only going to get one of two answers, then I've got to be very specific in what I'm asking. The way that we can ask more complex questions is to use these Boolean operators and we can have multiple statements in a row that's separated by a Boolean operator. And that Boolean operator has a very specific way of behaving. So it's like and is adding things together. And or is saying, is it this or is it that? Or if it's this or if it's that, then you can go ahead and do what you need to do. And we'll do more with those later. So there's a lot of new stuff this week. And we're starting to look at how do we really communicate with the computer. Python has two Boolean values. Now, in week one and week two, we talked about strings, and we talked about ints, and we talked about floats. Well, we're adding another basic primitive data type, and that is a Boolean. And a Boolean can either be true or false. That's it. There's only two. It come, every decision you make comes down true or false. And we're also introducing the concept of scope. Scope says, when am, when am I actually going to be able to execute some code? And right now, everything we've done, every line of code that we've written has been hit. And you can see that when you walk through the debugger in PyCharm. This week, we're going to see that that's not the case always. When we are doing our decisions, when we're doing branching, there are some decisions, some lines of code that we're going to hit and some lines of code that we're going to skip. And those lines of code are determined by the, the question that we've asked and the scope where the code resides. So everything we've done so far in, is, has been in what we call the global scope. That means everything gets run. We're now introducing the concept of a local scope. And a local scope is code that is defined inside of a class, function, loop, or branch. And it may or may not get run. So Python basically reads it in and stores it and then comes back to it sometimes. So um, all decisions are comparisons between two values. You may be able to but those decisions up against one another with Boolean operators, but it's always a comparison of two things. And the comparison is done based on those Boolean operators we just talked about. Every decision has to have an outcome. So there's no neutral decisions. They are either true or they are false. And for computers, you're comparing two memory spaces. So I have a Python script. And I have num1 equal 42 and num2 equal 18. Here I have a new line of code and it says if num1 is less than num2, print num1 is small. So what I'm doing here and the way I read this is 42 is less than 18, true or false. That is false because 42 is greater than 18. So when you're reading these branches and when you're thinking about them, what you're writing is a true-false question. You know, like in middle school when we had to take true-false quizzes, these are true-false questions. And that's all you can ask is a true-false question to Python. So let's talk about syntax and formatting. So this is just a quick little script, okay? And I'm going to input some user age, and I'm going to test that user age. Am I, over the, am I older than 18? Sorry, am I, am I 18 years or less, or am I over 18? So I have 
marked out here what is in the global and the local scope. User age, just like all the other stuff we've done, is in the global scope. The if statement is in the global scope, and that's what that is. This is an if statement. It starts with the keyword if, tells Python you're about to ask a question, then you're asking the question, ending with a colon, and we'll talk a little bit more about the actual formatting of these in just a minute. Um, and then after the if statement, you have to indent, and that's what puts it in the local scope. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in PyCharm so you guys can see a little bit more about what I mean. But the if statement is in the global scope. The print statement underneath that if statement is in the local scope. And if you don't have something in the local scope, you are going to get at minimum an indentation error from Python. The else for this script is in the global scope and the print over 18 is in the local scope. And that's a pattern you can follow, okay? When you have an if statement, once that if statement is, is finished and typed out, the next line of code has to be the local scope of that if statement. And then when you're done with the local scope of that if statement, the minute you backspace and remove the tab for the next line, it becomes into, in this case, the global scope. Oops, where am I? There we go. Okay, I forgot that I had a little animation here. So, if an elif tells Python it's going to make a decision, this statement reads, user age is less than 18, true or false. I don't know where my animation went. Hold on. Okay. We're just going to read it off this slide. I don't know why the animation was being weird. You have to have a colon. When, en when you're ending anything that has a scope in it, uh, uh, that's going to have a scope right after it, you have to end it with a colon. Don't forget the colon. It's one of those things that drives me crazy in Python. I don't know why. In Java, I use curly braces all the time. I don't know why I have a problem with this colon. but Remember the colon. Um, a few rules to remember. It's only in the local scope if it's indented. And a statement is a variable followed by a Boolean operator followed by a variable or value. So every single question has to follow that pattern. Variable or value followed by a Boolean operator, followed by a variable or value. Every single one. There's no deviation. Okay. Let's talk about scopes and indentations. So this is just something from Python. And this blue line is the left justified. Anything that is, any letter that is up against this blue line is the beginning, it, it is in the global scope. Local scope, you'll see, is that little orange line. Every letter that is, every beginning of a line, the first letter of a line, that is up against that orange line is in the local scope of whatever the global scope, the, the line on the outside is. So user age is global scope. The if statement is global scope if user age less than or equal to 18 colon is in the global scope which means python will always hit that line but lines seven and eight the, be the first character of those lines the p hits the orange line those are in the local scope of the if statement above them the else is left justified fully to the left it is in the global scope and the print over 18 is in, sorry, the else left justified is in the global scope, the print over 18 is in the local scope. Every branch keyword, if, elif, or else, there is a separate local scope and they don't know about each other. 
Your program can have multiple local scopes. You can also have if statements within if statements. And if statements within else statements, there's all kinds of ways that you can, um, you can mix and match this stuff. Computers aren't smart, neither are computer programming language. If I say, am I younger than 18, Python's not going to know what in the world to do. Python doesn't speak English. We have to speak Python. So how to ask a question, it's a true-false test, which I said. If I say, am I younger than 18, how do I get that question to be asked in Python? Well, it's with that script. I define a variable user age, and this is my test variable. This is going to hold a value that I'm, and I want to test that value against something. And it has to be defined before the if statement. Now I'm going to say user age, so my test variable, I'm going to test the value inside that variable less than or equal to 18. So I, this is a true or false question, and it all depends. The outcome of this all depends on what I put in for user age. If I put in 17, then 17 is less than or equal to 18. If I put in 42, 42 is not less than or equal to 18. So the outcome of that if statement is based solely on whatever value I input for user age. And then I'm going to have a local scope where I'm going to print 18 or less. That will only happen if the statement in the if evaluates to true. Else says otherwise print over 18. So uh, actually, I'm not going to do this one. I'm going to go through it in PyCharm because I think that is a little bit better. It's this one. Okay, we'll get we'll get to that one. So oh, let me configure the interpreter. So here I have what I just showed you, and I know I'm kind of belaboring the point with this, but. Uh, what I want to do is I'm going to put this through the debugger. So I have set a breakpoint on line 4, and I'm going to debug this. So what we see is user age equal int input. So what I'm going to do is, I have okay, so for anybody who hasn't been here when I've gone over the debugger before, one of the handiest features, I think, in Python is the debugger. And what the debugger allows me to do is it allows me to see what's happening in my program as I'm running it. So right now, I am stopped on this blue line. The line has not been executed yet, so nothing is happening on the console. But I can now control the program and say, okay, I want to I want to be able to look at things as they happen. This red dot is a breakpoint. And how you set a breakpoint is just this simple. You go to just to the right of the number and you right click. Sorry. Left click. So that's all you have to do. And you have a breakpoint set. And Python will stop wherever you have that breakpoint set. So, I'm going to step over this and now here down in the console, you'll see it went to a caret and a question mark, which means it's waiting for input. And I'm going to do 42. So now I am on user age less than or equal to 18. So I can now look right up here. PyCharm tells me my value is 42. I can also go down to the debugger and see user age is an int. So I get the type and it's 42. So here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say 42 is less than or equal to 18, true or false. If it is true, then I will do line 7 and 8. If not, I'm going to do line 10. So I'm going to step over, and I've, I've just jumped to line 10. I didn't do anything special. I just used the step over, which is going to step to the next executable line. And what happened is, Python ignored line 7 and 8 because 
I am 42, I am not less than or equal to 18. So it's not going to print less than or equal to 18. It's not going to print another line. It's going to print over 18. And I'm done. So now we're going to debug it again. And I'm at user age. I'm going to go to the console. You'll see I have three carrots on the console. When I step over, it's going to change to a carrot and a question mark, and that means it's waiting for input. So I'm going to put 17 here. So I hit the Enter key. Now I'm at if user age less than or equal to 18. User age is now 17. And by the way, at any point in the program, I can also mouse over and just let the mouse sit there for any variable, and it will give me the value of that variable. So 17 is less than or equal to 18, true or false. That's true. So now when I step over, I'm going to line 7. And I'm at line 7 because the if statement evaluated to true. And so I'm going to print 18 or less and another line. And then the program ends because there's nothing else to do after that. So that is what I mean by the, the local scope and the global scope. This was always executed. This was not always executed. Whether or not line 7 and 8 were executed depends completely on the outcome of this decision. And the outcome has to be true. So, go to this guy. All right. So, one more decision maker. I have, I want to know... Um, how long ago is my year? Well, I can say I have a test for a year. So this was just 3.2.4. I am going to input an integer called year. If year is greater than or equal to 2021, I'm going to say it, it's in the distant future. If year is greater than 2001, 21st century. If year is greater than or equal to 1901, 20th century. Otherwise, it was a long, long time ago. So these decisions are not mutually exclusive. In fact, whether or not some of these decisions are hit depends on what happened with the previous decision. And that's what LIF does. So if that decision will always be executed, they will always test that. If year is greater than or equal to 2101, you're going to print distant future, and that's the end of it. You're not going to hit this LF or else statements, and we'll do this again in PyCharm. If the year is not greater than or equal to 2020, 2101, then it's going to go and it's going to hit the elif and it's going to say, okay, year is greater than or equal to 2001. If that is true, it's going to print 21st century. If it's not, it's going to go to the next elif. But none of these elif or else statements will be hit if the if statement is true. And the elif, the second elif and the else statement won't be hit if the elif for year greater than 2001 is true. So let's do that one in PyCharm. 2.4. Is that it? Yeah. That's the one I want. So we'll just watch this work. So this is called mutual exclusivity. And what these are is if is mutually exclusive for the ELIFs um, and ELSE. means that only one of these things is going to happen. Now, if you had if statement after if statement after if statement, it would hit every single if statement. But because we have an ELIF here, it may or may not hit that. So let's see what happens. I'm going to make this bigger. And I'm going to debug this because I like the debugger. 
So it's waiting for input, and I'm going to start by saying it's 1801. So my year is 1801. One of the nice things you can do with the Python when you're in debug mode, with PyCharm in debug mode, is I can actually mouse over the relational operator, and it will tell me what the, the outcome will be. So this one's false. So now I hit the ELIF, and it's going to evaluate, and it's going to say, that's still false. 1801 is not greater than or equal to 2001. Then it's going to go to 1901. That's still false. And it's going to print long ago, and then it's going to print done. So if I run this again in the debugger, and my input is 2024, what do we think is going to happen? Well, 2024 is the year greater than 2020. Is 2024 greater than 2101? No, it's not. So this will evaluate defaults, so I will not hit line number 10. Is 2024 greater than 2001? Yes, it is. So this evaluates to true. So now I'm going to hit line 12, and it's going to print out what's coming from line 12, and you'll notice that it skipped this. It didn't even check this one, and of course this one got skipped because something else was true, and so we're done. This also means that you have to be careful about the order in which you're doing things, because if I had switched this order, I would never have made it to 1901 or 2001. So let me just show you what that would be like. So I'm just going to uh, copy this, and then I'll oops, just going to do this. Uh, no, be a pain. And it, oh, code, comment. Where's comment? Comment with line comment. Okay, there we go. Now I'm going to do something different. I'm going to change the order of this. I'm going to have this be the first one. I'll get rid of that. And I'm going to have this. Oops, be the second one. Format it right. And I'm going to make this an elif. Okay? The only thing I did was I changed the order. Didn't change anything else. And so let's see what happens if I put the same thing in again. If I, I'm going to stop here on line 20, and remember I just commented all that out. So... I want to see if I put in 2024, what will happen? Will I get 21st century or 20th century? So I am debugging it. It's waiting for my input. I'm going to put 2024. And what we will see is that but this is true. So I am going to step over. It's going to print 20th century. And I'm done. And that's the wrong answer. This is what we call a logic error. And the logic error is because the order in which I'm asking the questions is not correct. If I am asking a question that deals with greater than, I always want to have the, the highest number first. If I'm dealing with less than, I always want to have the lowest number first. So order is important here. So we're going to comment this out. Code. Comment. And I'm going to hopefully uncomment this and not recomment it. Code. Oh, uh, there we go. So I'm back to what I had. But it's order is important, and it's going to become more important as we do more things. 
So let's go back here. And Boolean operators. So we've just learned about if and elif and else and how short those questions are. I mean, it's variable, Boolean operator, sorry, variable, relational operator, variable or value. That's it. Those are the only questions I can ask. But I can combine my questions in one big long statement. And I use operators and an or. There's also a not operator. But we're going to concentrate right now on and and or. And these are what, these are truth tables. And means that both, at every single individual question that I ask has to be true for the whole statement to be true. And or means that one part of the statement has to be true for the entire statement to be true. So you can really hone how your decision and branches work using these Boolean operators. You can be extremely exclusive by putting, you know, question and, question and, question and, or you can be extremely inclusive by saying question or and then the next question then or. And this is basically how the, the truth table works. True and true for and, true and true is always true. For and, true and false is always false, which means if there's any single thing that is false in any of the questions you're asking while you're using that Boolean operator, then it's all false. With or, it's the opposite. True or true is true. That's the same. But true or false is true. And that's why this one is the or is very inclusive because you can have all these false statements and one statement that was true and everything becomes true. Whoops, hit the wrong thing. There we go. So let's just look at this a little bit. So I have numbers 10 and 2. Num 1 is 10, num 2 is 10. If I say num1 is equivalent to 10 and num2 is equivalent to 2. Well, let's take each of these by their piece parts. Num1 is 10 and I'm evaluating it against 10. So that means num1 is equivalent to 10, evaluates to true. Now let's not worry about what's in between. And then we're going to say num2 is equivalent to 2. Well, that would be true as well because I have, div I have assigned num2 the value of true. So this is true and true is going to be true. And this is pretty much how it works when the, when the program is doing it. Now, let's go to the next one. If I say num1 is equivalent to 10, well, that's true. We know it's true. And I have a num2 is less than 2. Well, that's false. So I have a true and a false, so that's always going to be false. If I, do, if I do one thing, which is just change that and to an or, so I have num1 is still equivalent to 10, still true, or num2 is less than 2, but I, because of that or, it evaluates to true. So. Or means if there's one truth, it's all true. And and means if there's one false, it's all false. Uh, so let's do, we'll do that one in a minute because we're going to learn about between. Okay, which one was I looking at? That's not it. Okay, let me go back and look at what I was looking at. Um, this one is simple Boolean. Okay. So let's go to simple Boolean. So this is just to show you what the truth table is. And um, it's just kind of to try and help out with the ands and the ors. So I'm just going to run through it real quick and 
let us do the current file. Now I just have A is 10 and B is 1. I'm not worrying about user input. So A is greater than 0 is true. B is greater than 0 is true. So I'm going to print true and true. Then I have if A is less than 10, which is false, and B is greater than 0, which is true, I'm not going to print anything. In fact, I'm going to drop to line 13, and it's going to say false and true is always false. So when this, this will be up, um, it's called Simple Boolean. It'll be up on the YouTube channel. There's a link to the Google Drive with it. And if you, if you have a question, you can go back and just run this through, and it will tell you. So in this case, A is equivalent to 10, which is true, and B is less than 0, which is a false. So I am now going to say false and false is false. Why did I say false and false? I should have said something else there. I'm sorry. Now we're going to talk about or. So if A is greater than 0 or B is greater than 0, then it's truthful. I can say is A less than 10, which is false, or B greater than 0, which is true. So this one is now true. So what was a false true with an and, it, it, what, and it was false, now we have a false true with an or, and it's true. And then the same goes for the next one. False and false is always false. So this is just a simple truth table. And I'm going to... False and false. I think it's supposed to be greater than. So this is up there. It'll be up on the Google Drive. Um, but this is what a truth table is. And what we need to make sure we have that for is the concept of between. So this is, this is a pattern, okay? And what we want to know is right now we want to know if an age is between two numbers. And for this we use and as well as the order. Order is very important here. So if my age is 20, am I between 0 and 4? Well, no, I'm not. So how do I write that up in Python? What I do is I say, what's my lowest bound? Well, my lowest bound is zero because I can't be a negative age. I can be not quite born yet, but I can't be negative. And then what's my absolute upper bound? Well, my upper bound in this one is if I am, you know, greater than 20. So we want to break this down into school age. That's what the problem talks about. So... The, the first bounding age is 4, because you're not going to go to school until you're above 4. So if my age is 20, am I going to school? Well, I'm not in between 0. I'm not greater than 0. Um, sorry, I am greater than 0, but I'm not less than 4, because I'm greater than 4. So I'm not going to school. So then I go to the next set of grades. So I'm greater than or equal to 4, but I'm less than 9. Well, no, I'm not. I'm 20. So I'm not in elementary school. Greater than 9, but I'm less than 13. Greater than or equal to 9, but I'm less than 13. So that means I'm not in middle school because I'm 20, and then I'm still 20, and I'm not in high school, so to infinity and beyond. But what is important here is the use of and as well as the order that I check the age. Okay? If I checked the age... Um, in the reverse order, there are things that might not turn out right. The other thing is that you'll notice that the top one is not inclusive of the final number. So if I have age greater than 0 and age less than 4, so I'm not saying less than or equal to 4 here. I'm saying less than 4. And on the elif, the next question associated with this question chain, 
I have great age greater than or equal to four. Because if I did it a different way, if I had age less than or equal to four, and age on the next line, age greater than or equal to four, I would not have a cohesive algorithm because I would be checking for the same thing twice. I would be checking for the same thing, expecting a different outcome. And I don't want to do that. So what time is it? Okay. Um, yeah, we've still got a little bit to go here. So we're going to talk about some complex questions. And there's a reason that I'm talking about this. And there is a, um, a file called floor.py that's also in the, um, up in the description. There's links to the Google Drive. Basically, this is going to be necessary for one of the labs. You have to use the floor operator and you have to do it in a very specific manner. So if I have a number 223 and I want to find the number of 100s that are in 223 and the number of 10s that are in 223 and I want to output plural if one or more, if there's one or more and output singular if there's none, uh, or sorry, if it's singular and then none if it's zero. So I can use a series of if statements to do this. First thing I have to do is my calculation. My num is 223, and it could have been any number. Hundreds equal 223 floor 100. And this will not work with the modular operator, and neither will your lab. You have to use the floor operator, and you have to use it like this. What floor does is it returns a whole number, and it's the number the, the number of times basically the divisor goes in to your original number whole times. So in this case, this would be two. And then I have my num, and I'm going to equal num minus hundreds times 100. So now I just want to get the remainder, and that's how I do it with this. And I'm going to say 10 equals num modulo 10, sorry, num floor 10. So I now have the t number of hundreds and the number of tens. I'm going to say if hundreds is zero, print no hundreds. I should have printed none. Hundreds is. And then else print 100. So. And then we finish it with if 10 is equal to 0, no 10s. If 10s is number is greater than 1, number of 10s is, and then we have 1, 10. So let's look at that one real quick. Where is it? Floor. So this is, this is a little bit closer to what your lab is. But I just wanted to run through it in PyCharm because I think sometimes it's actually easier to see the code working. So I've got a couple breakpoints here. And I am going to step in. And I've, got, I've just said my money equals 1142. And I have 100 is 100 and quarter is 25. And I just do that because that's best practice where I work. You don't actually put 100 in your code. You put it in a variable, and then you reuse the variable. So I'm going, if I look down here, because I'm in the debugger tab, if I look to the right of that tab, I see what my, my running numbers are. I have 100, I have money, and I have quarter. So my money is 1142. I have 100 is 100, and quarter is 25. So I'm now going to do the floor operator. So I have dollars is 11. So I'm going to print dollars, and then I'm going to say amount is money minus dollars times 100. So my amount is now 42, which is what it should be. I'm going to print the amount. I'm going to say quarters floor, um, sorry, quarter equals amount floor quarter. So I'm going to have one quarter because that's not, that's 25 into 42 is one whole number. And then I'm going to print quarters so I can see what's out here in the console, 11, 42, and 1. Now I'm going to do my if statement. So all of that was in the global scope and all of that was just calculations. So I'm going to say if dollar greater than zero, 
I'm going to print the number of dollars and I have to end it with a space because I don't want a new line here and, and this is important for the lab or Zybooks will, will, take, will just say you didn't get it right. Now I'm going to say if dollars is one, I only want to print the word dollar. Otherwise, I want to print the word dollars. So dollars is equivalent to one. And is it? Let's go check. What does PyCharm say? PyCharm says false. So I'm not going to print dollar. I'm going to print dollars. So if I look at the console, I'm printing $11. So I have if quarters is greater than zero, which is it is, I can look at that. Now, I'm going to print quarters and then another space. And I'm going to say if quarters is equivalent to one, and this is going to be true, then I'm going to print quarter. So with your lab, you won't do those. The, the first three prints, I just wanted to show what was happening during the running of the code. But this is a start to your lab to one of your labs, which we're going to go over in just a moment. So let's go back here. And this is a flow chart. And flow chart is, um, this is a flow chart of what the last thing was. But I don't think I'm going to go over it tonight. I think that we've we've done enough with going through PyCharm. So let's go over the labs. So these labs are a bit longer than Module 2, and they're going to test your ability to make decisions in Python, but you still have to use all the stuff you learned in Module 1 and Module 2. A decision in Python has one of two answers, A, N, S. Sorry about that. True or false, that's it. That's all you get. Make sure you design your if or elif statements accordingly. Zybooks will test your labs with different values. You have to remember that. So if it says that it's going to, that it's going to input a value, you have to use the input statement and you have to convert it to the right type, especially if you're using an integer. So that will definitely have to happen on one of your labs. Um, we're going to conduct the reviews this week using pseudocode. Now, prior to this, I have done flowcharts like this, but the flowcharts are getting are going to be too big after this week. Oh, one thing I did want to note here, yeah. So we had we talked about flowcharts the last couple of weeks, and this diamond symbol is a new symbol, and it means you're making a decision. So you will go into the diamond symbol and then you will come out of the diamond in one of two ways, false or true. But you have to take into account in your flowchart, hint, because you're going to have to do one this week, for the false and the true outcomes. What will happen if whatever your decision is outcomes to true, or what will happen if whatever your decision outcomes to false. So let's go through the pseudocode. So lab 3.11, write a program whose inputs are three integers and whose output is the smallest of the three values. So this is a classic between test. So that's what you're doing here. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to input, you're going to take three values in from Zybooks, first, second, and third. You're going to say if first is less than or equal to second and first is less than or equal to third. So this is using the and as the Boolean operator. So the only way it becomes true is if everything is true. Then you know that the first one is the, um, is the, the smallest number. If not, so here's you're going to use the elif second is less than or equal to first, and second is less than or equal to third, then you know second is the smallest number, 
Otherwise, it has to be thirds. So this is, this is a shorter program, but what it does is it uses that concept of between. Now we have 3.12. This is a big, long lab but it follows a very, very specific pattern. And it follows the specific pattern in floor.py, okay? But I'm sorry, no, 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 this, does, this wasn't it. This one, that's 3.13. This one is different. This is checking the seasons. So basically what they're gonna give you is they're gonna give you a month and they're gonna give you a day and you have to tell them what season it's in. So there are a big set of if and elif statements, and they pretty much have to go in this order. I've seen some people try and do this with structures because they already know about Python structures. But the easiest way to do is follow this pattern, OK? The first thing you're going to do is you're going to check if the month is. So you're going to do this month-wise. So first thing you're going to do is check the month. And then you're going to check the day. And you have to make sure that the day isn't less than zero and the day isn't greater than whatever the number of days is in that month. So for February, you can use 29. You don't have to worry about leap years. Just assume 29 for this particular problem. And you're fine until you come to a month where it splits a season. So here you're going to have an if, an elif, and an else inside of a month check. So the first check here for January is just we're checking to make sure it's January and that nothing is, you know, they didn't put in 1,029 or they didn't put in, you know, negative 27. And you're going to output winner. The second one is February, very similar to January, except in this case we're going to make sure that it's not greater than 29, and we're going to output winner. March splits a season, so we have to do more. So this is an LF. We're still going to check the month as the first thing to check. So assuming it's March, now we're going to say is the day greater than zero and the day less than or equal to 19. If it is, we're still in winter. Then we're going to check, and this can't be an else. It has to be an LF. We're going to check if the day is greater than 19 and the day is less than 31. If so, we made it to spring. Otherwise, it's invalid. So you follow this pattern the entire way through. Any month that does not split a season, you can do a single if or elif. Because remember, these are all else if. They're, so the, they're all related to one another. But if a month does not split a season, you can simply put one um, compound statement together, and it's fine. If a month does split a season, like September and March and June and December, then you're going to have to have an, another set of if elif statements in the local scope of the if elif statement for that month. So this is all about Boolean operators and using your if and elif properly. Here's the one that I was talking about just a minute ago. This is, we're going to say, the total change. Uh, they, they want you to get write a program with total change amount as an integer input and output the change using the fewest coins, one coin type per line. So what we have here is we're going to be given some input value. And then what we do is we have to get the number of dollars, the number of quarters, the number of dimes, the number of nickels, and the number of pennies. Once we have done all of that, and you'll notice there's only one if check at the beginning and then we do all of those arithmetic operations. And that's just to make sure they don't give you a negative number because Zybooks may very well give you a negative number. And if it does, you need to output no change and be done with it. Then after you do all the calculations, this is when the, um, the if and elif. And each one of these if statements 
is for the type of money. So you're going to have an if statement for dollars, a separate if statement for quarters. That's not an LF. A separate if statement for dime. So these are not related because they're each checking a different variable that means something different. It means dollars, it means quarters, it means dimes, it means nickels, or it means pennies. So within each of those if statements, you're going to output the number of dollars just like we did in Thor.py. And then you're going to say if the number of dollars is one, you're only going to output the word dollar singular. Otherwise, you're going to put output dollars. And then you do the same for quarters, nickels, dimes, and pennies. Those are long labs. Give yourself a good amount of time for these labs this week. So does anybody have any questions? Going once, going twice. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.